Welcome back. Today we will go through um, the required quantum theory for this course, including the postulates of quantum mechanics, some notation, so that we know how we can write down and uh, create our algorithms, how we can manipulate states, so um, single and multiple qubits, and what we can do with it. You know, despite our uh, everyday experience, uh, quantum physics is almost everywhere. Quantum physics actually is everywhere. It underlies anything we experience um, in our world, um, be that the evolution of the universe. So, you know, about 13.8 billion years ago, uh, everything, our whole universe, all the matter um, was compressed to a very small point, a singularity. And any time we go under a certain length, Planck length, um, then ideas of classical physics, so meaning the physics of our uh, macroscopic world, uh, these ideas cease to exist and uh, ideas of space time cease to exist and quantum theory becomes relevant. So that means the universe started or the start of the universe was um, governed or most likely governed by quantum theory. Um, we also see uh, medical uses. So imagine you have some quantum nanoparticles that can attach through cancerous cells. So then because they can absorb specific radiation, you can make cancerous cells visible with imaging technologies. We are also very interested in understanding the behavior of atoms and molecules on a quantum physical level. That is uh, because we want to be able to simulate these systems. The more accurate our simulations can be, or the more accurate our, we can simulate such systems, the better our understanding um, of these uh, systems will become. And that is relevant for, let's say we want to create better or, or work on better battery chemistry. We want to um, improve the cathode or anode structures. We want to improve doping. So then um, a detailed understanding of molecules is relevant. And right now, today, with today's quantum computers, we can simulate um, small molecules, single atoms, um, exactly. And we can see that, um, or verify that what we can do with these computers on small system um, matches the classical calculations that we can do. The bigger our systems become, let's say I have a molecule of 1,000, 1,500 electrons, which can be considered to be industry relevant, then simulations with classical computers are very difficult or impossible. And this is um, because imagine you have, uh, you want to add one electron to a system. Let's say we only have a, a molecule, a diatomic molecule has two nuclei and uh, it has some electrons surrounding it. And anytime I add an electron, I have to consider the Coulomb interaction between these electrons, the attraction between um, <clears throat> electron and nuclei, the repulsion between the nuclei and uh, that on a quantum physical level. So that's rather difficult for a classical computer. That's why we are very interested in understanding how we can use quantum computers for simulating quantum systems. So you say you use one quantum system to simulate another quantum system. And uh, we're not there yet. As I said, we can simulate single uh, simple systems um, and compare uh, these with classical simulations wherever possible. What re happens in reality with classical simulations, so if we want to simulate bigger systems, um, it is that we make assumptions, we make approximations. So let's say uh, we assume that the nuclei don't move. Actually, they do move, they're just a lot slower than electrons, but an assumption or an approximation would be these nuclei don't move, so we make them static. And that means um, the more assumptions, the more approximations I make, the less accurate my simulation of my molecule becomes and the less I'm able to understand this molecule. So that's why we want to look into quantum computing and some consider simulation of, of quantum physical systems the killer app for quantum computers. There are certainly other interesting things that we can do. Um, one thing that we will um, also look into a bit is quantum cryptography. There are actually two things that are interesting, quantum cryptography per se, where you use quantum devices such as um, a device that can um, create true random numbers, quantum random numbers. We will see what that means in a bit. Um, and then there's post-quantum cryptography. Post-quantum cryptography is concerned with finding algorithms that can withstand an attack of a theoretically perfect quantum computer. 
We don't have these machines today, so they're still prone to error and uh, they're small, so relatively small. We would need millions of qubits uh, and uh, perfect qubits um, to run an algorithm such as Shor's algorithm. We will learn about Shor's algorithm also in this lecture. Um, I mentioned it in my uh, last lecture, so it is the algorithm that can be used, um, or Peter Shor showed that you can use a quantum computer to do prime number factorization. So decompose a big number into its prime factors. And if you can do that, then you can also find out the private key uh, for RSA, for example. And this is very dangerous because right now, most of our communication, most of our encryption is based on algorithms such as RSA, Diffie-Hellman or elliptic curve cryptography. And uh, all these algorithms are uh, in danger given we would have a perfect quantum computer with sufficient number of qubits. I'm always very fuzzy about this because it's not clear what sufficient means in that case, um, but we'll get to that later. <clears throat> to put it in more concrete terms when we talk about uh, quantum theory, so there are four forces that we see in the universe. There is the electromagnetic force, the weak force, which um, is responsible or governs some forms of radioactive decay, beta decay, for example. Then there is the strong force, which holds the nuclei together, the atomic nuclei. And then there is gravitational force. And uh, for the first three of these, um, there is a sound quantum theory. For the fourth, gravity, um, you know, there have been discussions for a long time what an appropriate quantum theory could look like, uh, uh, but there is none right now. So there is not an agreement of a quantum theory. Someone has an idea, please let me know. Um, one problem with uh, uniting gravity and quantum theory is that quantum theory, as we mentioned in our last lecture, is discrete and uh, gravity is continuous. So that means quantum theory, when we remember, we remember the electron around um, the hydrogen atom, so it cannot occupy um, orbits continuously. Um, it must do that in steps. So that's why it's called quantum physics. It's quantized. But gravity um, gets weaker uh, with distance. However, it continuously gets weaker. So there is no discrete step as far as we know right now. So and that's the challenge. That's one of the challenges to unite these. Um, in terms of a computer science perspective, you may look at it as um, higher level languages. So all these forces that we see, you could say this is a higher level language, such as Python, Java, whatever you want. And uh, everything underneath it is quantum theory. So you could say quantum theory from a computer science perspective is the fundamental language of the universe. It's the machine language of the universe. And our universe operates according to quantum theory. And usually physicists do not call these higher level languages. So we come up with, or physicists come up with uh, nice interesting names such as quantum electrodynamics, quantum chromodynamics. But anyway, so <clears throat> for this course, we won't um, worry about the names. So what are the programs then? Imagine um, for a quantum computer or for any quantum system in the universe, we have some initial conditions. For a quantum computer, we set up these initial conditions. That could be a register of bits in the state zero, and uh, then you make an evolution. So you evolve the zeros, this state, the initial state, um, you evolve it towards a final state before you measure the system. We will also learn about measurement, by the way, in case you're wondering what that means. Um, uh, what's important is for a quantum computer, we need to understand this initial state very well, because only when we understand the initial state, we can run meaningful transformations that hopefully give us a solution to our problem or teach us something about the problem. This is also very interesting. So this is a small difference compared to classical computers. In quantum computing, um, you may not always be able to solve the problem, but you may be able to learn something about your problem that makes it easier to solve it classically. <clears throat> I know this first statement here is very provocative. Uh, when I say Moore's law becomes obsolete, let me explain a little more why I say Moore's law becomes obsolete. Um, 
the challenge that we see here is if you know Moore's law basically dictates that the feature size on silicon chips um, becomes smaller or halves every two years approximately. And uh, that means our silicon chips become more powerful and you all know this curve for our time. We just see an increase of computational power and also see a decrease in costs for making these chips. Well, we don't worry about the costs, so we worry about what happens if we make these chips smaller and smaller over the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years maybe. So let's say we extrapolate this up to 2050, then our computers would have the size or would be the size of atoms. And um, the thing is, you can um, engineer nuclear matter such that you can use it for computation. However, these systems are inherently complex to handle and get really hot. So it's very difficult to operate such a computer. But what then? So even if I was able to build such a computer, what's the next thing? And quantum physics, in that case, quantum computing, seems to offer a solution. So for certain problems, uh, a quantum computer is potentially millions of times faster than a classical computer for certain problems. So it's important to remember that quantum computers, uh, as we see them today, will always be coprocessors. Quantum computers will not replace classical computers. Classical computers can do certain things very well. You, as I mentioned last time, you will not need a quantum Internet Explorer. So uh, you will probably not need a quantum computer to watch a movie. But you will need a quantum computer um, to solve complex optimization problems, to simulate other quantum systems, to do very complex comp computations that you feel or that you cannot do today. And uh, quantum computers, so that's the hope, will allow us to access complexity classes that we cannot access today so that we can understand most complex systems, simulate and calculate most complex systems. Um, I have this example here with uh, quantum random access memory, which um, can store about 10 to the power of 12 bits with only 40 qubits. Why is that? Um, well, uh, there is one effect. And if you look um, at the upper right corner on my slide here, um, it's called superposition. Uh, this is the first thing that we will talk about when it comes to quantum physics. Uh, we will go, <clears throat> so as I structure this lecture such that we will talk about concepts, introduce them, and then we will repeat. We will go into more depth over time as we need it. So this is not the last time you hear about superposition. This is not um, all the details we will learn and talk about when it comes to quantum effects. So there is more to come. Um, but back to superposition. Superposition just means um, exactly that. We have um, a superposition of states. So in the classical information theory or classical computer science, um, the smallest unit of information is a bit. And the bit can have one value and assume one value. It can be zero or one. And uh, let's say I have a string of bits, very long, thousands, millions of bits. Um, I can do manipulations on this string of bits. Um, and if there is a calculation, I can at any point, or if I execute a calculation at any point, I can interrupt this calculation. I can look at the current state, and it doesn't harm it. And I can continue. Um, and there is only one definite configuration at a time. There is not two possible configurations of this bit string, So, which means maybe one bit being zero and the next configuration, everything the same, but another bit being one. Uh, it's different in quantum physics or in quantum computing. Here we have a direct connection to physics. Um, I could say, for example, that my bit is an electron string, uh, uh, electron spin, sorry. And I could say um, the value one is represented by spin up, the value zero, and I get minus one, is spin down. Or I could say I have an electron around uh, a nucleus. So let's again take the simplest um, atom that we have, which is a hydrogen atom. We just have one proton and we have an electron around it. And I could add energy. So and say the high orbit is one and the orbit that's close to the nucleus represents zero. And depending on how I implement my qubit, if it's um, 
system like my atom, if it's electronic spin, if it's magnetic flux qubits, where I induce current in both directions and create two magnetic fields, one up and down, depending on how I implement it, as long as I don't look at it, I will have the superposition. So a superposition is the state of being in zero and one at once. In terms of the electron, that would mean um, our electron is both close to the nucleus and both far away from the nucleus at once, occupies both zero and one at once. In theory, it quantized anything in between two, but we're only interested in computational basis states. So we wanna make sure that it's only zero or one. But if it's only zero or one in terms of superposition, that means um, it coexists at the same time until I look at it. And looking at it is crucial in terms of um, the uh, atom, uh, it would mean firing polarized laser light at it. So finding out where the electron is actually, and by firing polarized laser light at it, I add, or, uh, I add, I add energy to that system. And as we learned before, when we went through the quantum numbers, this can be very difficult. So it's very important um, and crucial that we um, do not interact with our quantum computer, our quantum system too much um, until we are done with our computation. Once we're done, we can look at it. But looking at it comes with a caveat. Looking at it means our rich superposition of states, the zero and one will collapse into one definite state. So we will end up for one bit with either one or zero, <clears throat> depending on the probability amplitude associated with each of these states. <clears throat> and this generalizes to strings of quantum bits. So if we have two quantum bits and each of these bits can occupy or be in two states, and this would mean I have two to the power of two equals four possible states that I can evaluate at once or possible solutions to a problem that I can evaluate at once. At once means I can have all these possible configurations and I wanna make sure when I measure the system, I only get the one solution that really is the solution to my problem or tells me something about my problem. Um, <clears throat> and so that's the one effect, superposition. And then uh, there is another effect that's very important because if we would only have um, quantum bits that are not connected to each other, single quantum systems, then we would have a lot of one bit systems and yes, we would have them in a superposition, but that doesn't do us any good. So assume in the more practical sense, I have a problem such as optimizing traffic, then <clears throat> the routes that vehicles can take um, can be represented, uh, or let's say the decision can be represented with zero or one for each route. Let's say I have one vehicle, three possible routes, then I could for each of these routes set it to zero or not taking it and one take it. Um, however, I wanna make sure that if I send one vehicle on a certain route, um, that that doesn't hamper with other vehicles because if I wouldn't consider all correlations, any interaction of all vehicles with each other, um, I would probably cause traffic jam somewhere. So let's say I want to get rid of all the traffic jam, then I must understand how moving 10 vehicles from here to there affects all the other vehicles that are already there. And uh, this is where correlation comes into play. In classical <coughs> theory or in classical computer science, we have correlation. Um, and there is stronger than normal correlation in quantum physics. And uh, we'll also learn in more detail what that means. But for now, um, let's just say I have one quantum bit here and another quantum bit there. And if I do something to that quantum bit, it immediately affects what uh, the state of this quantum bit. And I can entangle quantum bits in different ways. I can say if that one is one, I wanna make sure that this one is one too. If that one is zero, that should be one. If that one is one, that should be zero. And um, that's it, basically. And um, <clears throat> what uh, the inter another interesting thing of entanglement is that distance doesn't matter. So whether I have these quantum bits here in that room and one here, one here, or this other quantum bit far away in Andromeda galaxy, um, it doesn't matter. The effects are instantaneous. So without time delay. That means if I still, if I have that one here and the other in Andromeda galaxy, if I have 
if I do something to that qubit, immediately, without time delay, uh, however my correlation, however I entangle these bits, immediately something will happen to that qubit. And you will say, well, that violates special relativity because nothing can move faster than light. So instantaneous is not possible. I cannot, without uh, time delay, communicate between these two. And uh, so, yes, good point. Um, and there is Bell's theorem, so and um, Bell's inequality. So in John Stuart Bell, you may want to look him up, um, just summarizing what he did. He uh, proved that there is a no hidden variable. So a no hidden variable means that there is no communication, no physical communication between two entangled systems. Uh, there are other explanations of how entanglement works, but for us in uh, quantum computing, it is enough to understand that I can use it to correlate bits so that I can influence one bit state with another bit state. That's sufficient. There is a third effect that's not on that slide. Um, I will quickly explain it here on the board. It's tunneling. So these two um, effects, they are very important for all quantum computers. Um, only if you have these two, you can do relevant computation. There is a third one for special purpose quantum computers, quantum annealing systems. And quantum annealing systems, <coughs> we'll learn more about that later too, uh, quantum annealing systems um, are used for solving optimization problems. And let me let me turn off that light here. Is that better? No, I see some reflection here. Well, I hope you can see it. Um, so uh, quantum annealing systems are so used for solving optimization problems. And uh, imagine you have in our classical world a particle flying through space. And here we have an energy barrier. Um, then what happens in our classical world, um, the particle will bounce back. So it will not just fly through that energy barrier. But in quantum physics, the more wave-like our behavior becomes, so you may have heard about wave-particle duality, so it depends on how we observe a particle. Sometimes we see particle behavior, sometimes we see wave-like behavior, so we have interaction patterns. But <clears throat> if we consider wave-like behavior and we have an energy barrier, then what happens is that the particle may tunnel through that energy barrier. That's something that's impossible in classical physics, in the classical world. But in the quantum world, um, we may tunnel through that energy barrier. And this is specifically interesting for solving optimization problems. Um, imagine you have a problem that comes with a solution landscape, um, an optimization problem that looks like that. So. What a classical algorithm can do, any classical algorithm, it is walk the surface. So you can do gradient descent. The algorithm may start here and uh, you can with gradient descent walk down. And uh, if the valley here is not too deep, with some tricks, give it some momentum, um, you can jump over that hill. So you will not be stuck in a local minimum. You may be able to find the next minimum or you're not stuck in this local minimum. So then you go down here, um, but it's more difficult because that hill is higher here, more difficult to get out of that local minimum. Um, so what may happen is that the algorithm gets stuck in this local minimum and um, <clears throat> tells you, well, that's the best solution that I can find. You may give it more time. You may use even more tricks. You can parallelize. You can start at 1,000, 10,000 points in parallel. But what if this landscape is not only two dimensional, but what if it's one million, one billion dimensional? Um, no matter the dimensions, um, classic algorithms always work the same. You can walk the surface. However, if we use that effect, quantum tunneling, then we also imagine our solution landscape to an optimization problem as uh, having our good solutions again on the hills, the bad solutions in the valleys. Um, but with tunneling, if this area here under the curve is not too big, uh, then we may tunnel through these energy barriers and uh, finally end up in the local minimum. That's what quantum annealing systems basically do. They also assume a superposition of states or a superposition of uh, possible solutions to a problem. But uh, solving or finding the minimum value configuration um, 
is done by tunneling through the energy landscape. And we may finally end up with the best solution, although classical algorithms may get stuck. So I know there is always um, advances in classical computing too, and classical algorithms get better and better too. Um, <clears throat> but what if we have a time constraint? What if we um, only have two seconds um, for finding an optimal solution in terms of um, Sorry, my screen just froze. So what if we only have <clears throat> two seconds to solve this problem? Um, like in traffic flow optimization. So in traffic flow optimization, we collect position data of vehicles every one to five seconds. You wanna make sure that you solve this problem. So how to optimally distribute the vehicles also within that time interval, every one to five seconds. So I have a time constraint here. And uh, if I have a time constraint and give the same time to a quantum annealing system and the same time to a classical system, let's say simulated annealing to solve that problem, then I may have an advantage by solving it quantumly with a quantum annealing system. <clears throat> uh, let's talk a bit more about why quantum computing um, is relevant or can become relevant in the future even more so. Uh, there is, uh, we talked about some, some differences to classical computers. So quantum computers are hardware um, inherently um, different to classical computers. So a quantum chip does not only do the computation, a quantum chip also functions as a memory. So you store um, the whole problem on the chip and then uh, you uh, do your computation. The other interesting thing is uh, we talked about superposition before. Um, that let's say we talk about two qubits in two states again, and I have two to the power of two equals four possible solutions um, to a problem. If I add one qubit, uh, let's say I have three, then it's two to the power of three equals eight possible solutions to a problem that I can evaluate at once. And that uh, shows you one of the inherent powers of quantum computers. Anytime you add a bit, you double the computational power. Of course, there is more to it. Um, there is error correction and how good your qubits are. But um, in theory, if you had a perfect quantum computer uh, with all bits um, being able to interact with any other bit, if you add uh, one bit, you double the computational power. And um, <clears throat> we have effects that we don't see in classical computers or that we don't have in um, to our avail for uh, doing computations with classical computers that are superposition, entanglement, and uh, sometimes interference. So interference is uh, very often a problem um, uh, because uh, let's say I have magnetic qubits and anytime I want to communicate between these qubits, these magnetic fields are very weak. Anytime I, I wanna communicate, I need to move electrons and the moving electric charge creates a magnetic field. So, and that may hamper with the computation. Also, the earth magnetic field um, is very is too strong for um, letting it interact with my qubits if I have um, superconducting quantum interference devices. So I wanna make sure to isolate my quantum system in that case from the earth magnetic field and tunneling. So I haven't mentioned tunneling on that slide. And why we look into it specifically is because there are many problems that today's computers cannot solve and may not be able to ever solve, which are problems in transportation and logistics. Uh, let's say I wanna do traffic flow optimization. I wanna make sure that I solve the optimal distribution of vehicles rather quickly. So the, as often as I get my data, let's say every one to five seconds is what we have today for certain use cases. I wanna make sure that I can solve this problem within one to five seconds. That doesn't mean the vehicles always get um, the updated routes every one to five seconds. It just means if there's something happening like a crash or if there is minimization of flow caused due to any other problem at any other uh, point in that traffic graph, I wanna make sure that the optimization algorithm reacts as quickly as possible. Um, I wanna gain some time. 
Um, we have other optimization problems like tool distribution and production, where I also want to be fast. So I want to make sure that my tools are there or where they are needed. My limited set of tools or limited amount of tools are where they are needed at a given time so that production can um, and runs can continue and run smoothly. Um, where else? So in terms of artificial intelligence and um, specifically machine learning, we're interested into uh, looking into quantum computing because as you know, training specific algorithms or certain algorithms takes time. Uh, the other thing is that very often I'm not accurate enough. So <clears throat> assuming I train a very complex neural network, one that we may use in self-driving vehicles, one uh, that we use for a use case called behavioral cloning. Uh, behavioral cloning is I just record the driver behavior and record everything the vehicle sees. So in my vehicle, I have cameras, I have LiDAR, I have radar, I have um, ultrasound. Um, and um, this is basically all vision. So anything that the vehicle perceives is combined into one stream. So we do sensor fusion and combine it into one stream. And uh, this is my X values. So the X that goes into my algorithm. And the Y values, what the algorithm should predict is what the driver does. So at any given situation, I don't only record what the vehicle does, we also record what the driver does. How to use the steering wheel, braking maneuvers, acceleration, gear shifting, everything that there is that can be recorded. And so you create sort of behavioral cloning. So in any given situation, you um, train the algorithm such that it um, executes driver behavior, ideally. And ideally you get um, a good driver um, back, but that's not the only um, algorithm that we use in self-driving vehicles. There is more, but this is uh, one, one additional layer. Um, also in neuroscience, we're interested in understanding more about quantum effects, um, let's say in the brain. Right now, it is not clear if quantum effects have a, or play a role in conscious perception. It may be the case um, that because everything in the world, as we know, is based on quantum physics, so why shouldn't also our brain work according to quantum physics? But there is no proof for that um, or no proof against that. It's, um, it always depends on who you're talking to. Um, and uh, if we wanted to have a better understanding, so we would need to be able to look into a living brain and scan a living brain quantum physically, but that's not possible right now. But maybe with simulations, um, with being able to quantum physically simulate a brain, we would be able to get better understanding. Right now, we can't do that. Uh, we're interested in simulated physics, material science. Um, this means, uh, so what we talked about before, we want to learn about improved battery chemistry. We want to make um, better cathodes or anodes, um, which requires us to quantum physically simulate molecules. We are also interested in um, simulating, for example, the behavior of glue. So let's say you have carbon plates. So you have a vehicle that's made or a chassis that's purely made of carbon. So carbon doesn't bend, it just breaks. But where you glue the plates together, they bend. And if you can exactly simulate, quantum physically simulate that glue, that allows you to do more precise um, <clears throat> crash simulations. We are, uh, so while interesting, we are uh, not working on, on um, problems related to medicine, but um, this is very similar to simulated physics. So if, you, if you're able to simulate molecules uh, for an industry use case, then you may also gain advantages um, in medicine. So in medicine, people are interested in um, let's say quantum nanoparticles, that's one thing, but when it comes to quantum computing, they are interested in um, seeing the effects of a drug on proteins, for example, So, but on a quantum physical level. So the interaction of that drug with um, molecules um, in your body. So how can I exactly simulate that behavior? That's very interesting. So that will help us understand um, how to cure certain diseases. Yeah? Um, and again, we will talk about all of this in more detail. We will look at two architectures that are interesting for uh, quantum computing. So one is quantum annealing, the other one is gate model quantum computing. 
Uh, we will look into both in more detail. Uh, it's just, as I said before, we will iterate over um, different levels of detail. So quantum annealing systems, you see them in the slides on the left side here. Uh, quantum annealing systems are special purpose computers. So they can be used for solving one specific, or let's say two um, kinds of problems. It's optimization problems and sampling tasks. Um, here um, on the uh, this first equation that shows an icing spin model. So an icing spin model, um, it gives you the interaction terms of the qubits of the of the spins in that case. So it spins i's and j, and a b i j give you the strength of the interaction here. And here you have the diagonal terms. And uh, why we have the Pauli Z transformation here, we will look into more detail later. But for now, um, it's very important to understand um, that um, what we have um, or what we do here is initialize um, our system in a well-defined um, configuration, which is here the poly um, X matrix or poly X transformation on the qubits. And uh, then uh, you see these A's and B's here. These are envelope functions. So over time, these envelope functions um, shift priority. So at first, um, the initial term is very important, but then the problem Hamiltonian, so the problem function here, the B of S is very important. S is just a function of linear time. We will also look into that in more detail later. Um, so programming, and I make this um, Python's here in the air, programming a D-wave machine means preparing a big matrix. There is a corresponding classical optimization problem. It's called QBO or quadratic unconstrained binary optimization problem. And uh, you can see here on the left side, again, uh, you have um, your diagonal. Um, so, and your Qs give you the qubits. So here you have again interaction between qubit i and qubit j and the strength or the, the form of the interaction that you have here. And um, here you see i smaller than j also here. That means uh, what we create is an upper triangular matrix with an interaction of each qubit. And uh, it turns out that you can formulate almost any discrete optimization problem in a way uh, that it can be transformed in a quadratic unconstrained binary optimization. Sometimes this is efficient, sometimes it is not. So only because I can do it doesn't mean I have to do it, but sometimes we may gain some advantages by doing it. <clears throat> Here on the right side of your um, slides, uh, what we are on the slide, what you see is a um, uh, first description of gate model systems. Um, gate model or universal quantum computers are those that everyone wants to have and that we all are waiting for. However, um, we only have small systems available right now. Where for quantum annealing systems, we currently have about 2,000 qubits and expect 5,000 qubits later that year. We have uh, around 70, 72 for gate model chips um, that we can use today. So and there are different ways of implementing gate model quantum computers. So there are Again, superconducting qubits, there are um, ion traps, there are photonic quantum computers, um, but independent of the implementation, the physical implementation, they always um, do the same. So what you do is you initialize your quantum register, so the input register, you initialize that again in a well-defined state. Let's say it's all zeros, which can be achieved by, um, if it's atoms, you cool them down, so and it would be all zero. Um, and um, then you apply unitary transformations. Unitary transformations um, is a very specific kind of transformation, but basically what they do is, is they preserve unitarity. So we apply, uh, so a transformation is a matrix to a state, as is a vector. And let me quickly write that down. If we look at uh, a very simple system, we will uh, have time to talk about this in a lot more detail later in that lecture, but just to give you a brief understanding, and here it doesn't matter if you're dealing with quantum annealing systems or gate model chips, we talk about um, the same formalism here. Uh, and also don't wonder about how I write these states here. So you see, this is a very specific way of writing it. It's the bracket notation. It's just a vectorial representation or a, a form of writing down vectors. We'll learn more about that. So this one is the state zero, this one is the state one. In vectorial form, we would say the state zero looks like that and the state one looks like that. 
And uh, now applying a gate or a unitary transformation um, preserves the unit length of these vectors. So always when we're dealing with qubit states, we're dealing with uh, unit length vectors. It doesn't matter um, if it's one qubit or if it's n qubits. So let's generalize this to a bigger system. Let's say we have zero, zero here, um, which is two dimensional qubit space. Two dimensional qubit space equals four dimensional vector space, um, which look in that case would look like that. Right, and uh, we have, of course, other states, any other combination that we have or that we can envision um, out of these two qubits um, would then become, again, four dimensional vector. And uh, what our unitary transformations must do, and we will learn why that is the case, what our unitary transformations must do is preserve the unit length, so the length of the vector. They cannot change that. Uh, let's look at a very simple transformation. Um, one that everyone knows that also exists in classical computing, which is not. So not in uh, quantum computing, we'll just write it as a big X, and um, we applied it to a one qubit state here, to the state zero. So the not transformation, we will learn about a lot more transformations later. Just look at that one for a moment to get a basic understanding. The not transformation looks like that. I have... Um, a two-dimensional matrix um, because in that case I apply it to a two-dimensional vector, right? So I applied a dot transformation to the vector one zero. So if we do that calculation, um, then our result is zero times one plus one times zero equals zero. And then I have one times one plus zero times zero equals one. So we see what the not transformation did to our vector is it made the state zero to the state one. And the interesting thing um, that we also see in quantum computing, it's reversible, which we will also have some time to discuss it later. But that means if I apply it again to the state one, then uh, the resulting state is zero. You may try it for yourself. <clears throat> Let's look at another example that I have here. Here we see um, a very specific transformation, the Hadamard transformation. The Hadamard transformation is uh, unique to quantum computing, so there is no classical equivalent to that. And uh, this does to one qubit state um, what is already very remarkable in quantum computing. It makes a definite state a superposition state. A superposition state meaning, let's say I take one qubit um, that is in the definite state, zero or one, a superposition state is an overlapping state where you see both zero and one at once. So and let me um, give you that quick example here, just so you see how that works. The Hadamard transformation is given by, again, if I apply it to a one qubit state, is given by a two-dimensional matrix, which is this. So this is a square root of two. Um, this is a very another another interesting thing um, because we're talking about probability amplitudes. Um, we'll explain that later. So just remember, if I have square root of true and I square that, it's one half. So in quantum physics, we talk about probability amplitudes. It's not probabilities per se. Only the squared amplitude gives us the probability of a certain state um, of quantum system being in a certain state. Let's look at this in more detail. So let's say I apply the Hadamard transformation to the state zero here. So I again, um, take my zero vector here, one zero, and uh, I execute that. So what I do is I do one of square two times one, one of square two um, times zero. Gives me one half. And then I do one, uh, 1 over square root 2 times 1 plus minus 1 over square root 2 times 0. Again, gives me 1 over square root 0, 1 over square root 2. So and you see that's slightly different to what we had before. So here my state 0 is given by 1, 0. So I have one definite, so I have a 1 here and my 0 here, and the state 1 is given by 0, 1. Here I now have half the chance of being in each. This is my superposition. So this is also, by the way, called my wave function. We talk about the probability amplitudes only. I can write that down slightly differently. I can say 
Um, because remember, here we see state zero. So this means it's half the probability of being the state zero plus half the probability of being in the state of one. And the same applies for the state one. Um, here uh, on the slides, you can see that if you apply this transformation to the state one, the only difference than to, uh, to applying it to the state zero is that you have a different relative phase. We talk about global and relative phases. Um, global phases um, are phases uh, that um, are outside, so are relevant for the, the global state. And we have relative phases where you have only one subsystem being affected. And uh, relative phases matter, global phases don't. Relative phases uh, give you uh, a different relative phase, like we have here in zero, Haramad zero and Haramad one, different relative phase is a different qubit state. Uh, a different global phase is the same state, doesn't matter. Um, I hope that helps. We will learn about transformations and how to execute them and how to use them, how to create them even um, in a lot more detail. This is just to explain to you what the difference in uh, between these two architectures is between quantum and dealing systems and gate model systems. Um, we will mention or we want to mention one more thing, which is um, quantum supremacy. So if you talk to vendors, uh, quantum computing vendors, software vendors, they will probably bring up the term quantum supremacy. And quantum supremacy um, is the one, uh, so it uh, was coined, I think, by John Preskill or um, I don't know, um, some people at Google, but um, quantum supremacy means um, basically um, the, we do a computation with a quantum computer that a classical computer, no matter how powerful it is, if it's, uh, of course, not a laptop, but a data center or the biggest supercomputer, most powerful supercomputer in the world, um, quantum supremacy means that um, if you, um, uh, you can do a computation with a quantum computer that a classical computer can never do in finite time or never finish in finite time. That's basically it. Uh, we want to talk about, yeah, that's the point. We want to talk about useful quantum supremacy because these days um, we will see lots of announcements about quantum supremacy, uh, lots of announcements um, that are being made. Um, and the, the thing that I think we should have an eye on is, is it useful quantum supremacy? Yes, it is very important to show that you can do things with a quantum computer that a classical computer cannot do, but we've done that for a very long time. It's not time to show that you can do things with a quantum computer that a classical computer cannot do and that matter. And things that matter, for example, would be simulating an industry relevant molecule, um, improving battery chemistry. Um, these are the things that we wanna be able to do. Um, <clears throat> I made this separate slide here, um, talking about quantum assisted algorithms that goes um, hand in hand with what I mentioned before. Uh, usually, uh, what or what we expect is that quantum computers are coprocessors. Quantum computers will not replace classical computers. And the thing is that, um, let's say we look at a machine learning algorithm, there is still a significant classical part. It all comes down to how you define that algorithm. But there is data preparation. So you need to ingest that algorithm, uh, that data into your algorithm. The algorithm runs through that data. Let's say it's a neural network. Um, you give it some x vector and with uh, some x values, and uh, you produce a y vector, so some prediction. And uh, then, um, in the beginning, before you start training that algorithm, the prediction will just be awfully wrong. So you take that error, the difference, let's say, between the predicted output and the actual output, and uh, use that to propagate. Um, it back through the network. So you use the error to you propagate the error back through the network and adapt the weights of the neural network. That's how it works. Um, there are different algorithms. Genetic algorithms, for example, allow you to just assume a number of neural networks and explore populations of neural networks and always take the best ones. And uh, then in the next generation, you create um, offspring based on uh, the, best, um, uh, the best neural networks that you had in the previous generation. So anyway, but let's say we look at um, back propagation. Um, so you propagate the arrow back through that neural network, the algorithm that is mostly used for that is called back propagation. And um, what you need to do is uh, you need to um, 
do gradient descent. So you take your arrow and I use a differentiable uh, error function, a cost function, and then uh, you do a gradient descent based on that error that is predicted. And uh, let's say um, you have a solution landscape that looks like that. Then um, the bigger the error is, the more steeper, the deeper, the faster you go down that hill. So you want to converge. And um, the thing is that this gradient descent that you do here, you can replace that with a quantum annealing system. You can do quantum annealing instead of an atom optimizer. So do the gradient descent slightly differently. That's one way to look at it. Um, but the thing that I want to say is that only a very small part in any algorithm that we look at today, in, that's why we call it quantum assistor or quantum enhanced algorithms, um, only a very small part is quantum, the complex part. We take the most complex part out of a classical algorithm, try to embed this on a quantum chip and get a meaningful solution for that, and then feed that into our classical algorithm iteratively. So I make some calls until our neural network in that case converges to a quantum machine. Um, and that's why we have a distinction here in type of algorithm and type of data. Um, when we look at the upper left corner, that's what we do in classical machine learning. You take some classical data as an input and uh, let's say you have a self-driving vehicle. Currently it's not quantumly trained. So you have a classical data, all the data that the vehicle sees out there is classical. And um, you have an algorithm that is classical. Um, so a classical neural network, like a convolutional neural network that learns to um, detect or learns to classify um, uh, traffic signs or learns to uh, identify pedestrians, for example. Then you have, um, in terms of data, classical data, and could say in a quantum algorithm. So that's what we look at um, very often today. We take some classical input data and try to maybe replace some parts of that algorithm with a quantum part. And um, still, the data is classical and do um, quantum analysis. Um, or quantum enhanced algorithm. So in the upper or lower left corner, we see um, the type of data is quantum. So let's say you have um, some electronic structure data for a molecule simulation, but you still have to do it with a classical algorithm. This is the approximations that we talked about before. We want to simulate a molecule exactly, but we do it classically, which is incredibly difficult with classical computers. And then the holy grail is the bottom right corner, quantum, quantum. So this is a very is an open question, a research question. How do you optimally formulate transformations that the data, the input data, is generated on your chip? So remember, our chip holds the data and it does the computation. So instead of feeding the data into the chip, which is very time consuming, um, I want to make sure that I can create a transformation or a series of transformations that can create that data on the chip and then execute my other transformations and learn my result of the problem. And this is very difficult. So this is diff different for any kind of problem. Um, there is not one solution that fits all. And it's an open research question, as I said. So there is a lot of work going into that. And a lot of people are thinking about that, how to do that. And um, uh, that's also uh, relevant for comparing the performance of algorithms. It would be easy to say, I take a quantum chip and do not consider the pre-processing. I only take the time that it takes to process the data on the chip, which is maybe five nanoseconds, um, and compare it to a classical algorithm. But that's unfair. Uh, what we really want to do is make a comparison uh, of end-to-end -end processing from taking the data and transforming it, ingesting it, embedding it on the chip, um, getting the results classically, interpreting the results. Because that's also how we run a classical algorithm. So I can't say my classical neural network takes a day and my quantum chip takes five nanoseconds. Because in the end, if I have a quantum classical algorithm, it may also take a day, but each call to the quantum chip may only take five nanoseconds. Unless I can really make a transformation that creates the data on the chip. So that's, that's important. Please remember that. I brought some real world examples and we will not go into full detail of, of all of these examples here. Uh, but in the past, when I taught these lectures, or I taught this lecture, um, then I would always start with a theory. I would start with the quantum theory and the fundamentals. But then I would very often get the question, but what can I use it for? It's so different. Uh, what's the practical relevance? So I thought maybe it is, uh, I mean, this may still be confusing, but maybe it is helpful. Maybe it gives you some idea of what quantum computers can be used for. 
And there are a lot more examples in this presentation that I will not go through. I will just give you some of these and you may be, um, maybe are interested in looking through the other examples yourself. Um, let's look at the first ones. Uh, this is uh, traffic flow optimization. So I will upload a presentation that will run these videos here. I'm currently on a PDF, so that's why it doesn't play these videos, but I will upload these videos um, into the presentation folder so you can see the difference between um, the situation before the optimization and after the optimization. So the first problem about four years ago that we looked into um, practically uh, at Volkswagen was traffic flow optimization. So I've been um, uh, teaching and working in the field of quantum computing for a while, but only academically. So more, more, it's a lot longer than, than uh, I've been doing it at Volkswagen. So I've been in the field for almost 10 years now. But the question always was, when can I finally use it Practically, when can I finally use it to solve something that matters for a company, that matters for people out there? Um, and not only looking at algorithms that show, well, I can do something with a quantum computer that a classical computer cannot do, but it, there's no practical relevance. So four years ago, it was about four years ago, maybe a little longer, we started thinking about um, uh, problems that could be solved with existing quantum annealing systems. Back then, 1,000 qubits, um, already very big, uh, but only suitable for optimization problems. And um, what we thought uh, would be good is to have a problem that anyone can understand um, and that everyone can, can grasp and relate to. And this is traffic flow optimization. No one likes traffic jams, at least no one that I know of. And the idea was um, to um, get rid of traffic jams at all. I know this is an ideal uh, assumption and this is not what happens with any traffic flow optimization system here in the world. It's just, um, an assumption. And back then, this algorithm didn't solve the world's traffic problems. It showed, though, that you can take some real world data, traffic data, embed it on a quantum chip and get a solution that is comparable to what you can get with a classical computer, but faster. And <clears throat> um, so what they did was, or what we did was, I will learn about um, the um, how or about the details, how this works a little later, because I need to explain to you how the topology of the chip looks and uh, how to embed the problem on the chip. But what we could do was um, give uh, vehicles, let's say I have 500 vehicles that I predict will cause a traffic jam in 15 minutes. Um, here you see a classical part that's nothing to do with quantum computing. Uh, it's a sort of survival data mining um, where you just predict an event that's going to happen in a given time frame. So I predict um, that in 15 minutes, uh, 500 vehicles will cause traffic uh, jam at intersection X, Y, whatever that intersection is, or on a highway, freeway, whatever it is. Um, this we learn from historic data. We have historic movement data. Um, the data set that we used um, for this project is the T-Drive data set available for download from Microsoft. It gives you 10,000 taxis moving through the city of Beijing over five days with timestamps and geo coordinates. So we could really um, determine the movement patterns and um, or the, the routes that the taxis took. And um, so the assumption that we made was just, let's say we have three days and not five days, train our algorithm on three days and uh, then let's predict one hour ahead, 20 minutes ahead, what's possible. So we found out that um, with sufficient accuracy, and that means um, we do not predict traffic jams that never happen and we do um, not miss to predict the traffic jam that then happens. So with sufficient accuracy, we can predict up to 15 minutes, maybe 20, depending on the city or depending on the complexity of the city. So we predict 15 minutes ahead, we know that 500 vehicles will cause a traffic jam. So I wanna make sure that we um, resolve this before it happens. And this resolving this is done quantumly. So I used the quantum chip, a quantum annealing system specifically, um, where we said each of the vehicles um, will get three routes, not the same routes. For each vehicle, we have three different routes. We, de we, de we calculated this before with a mapping system. Um, we used Nokia here or here maps for that, uh, but any mapping system is fine. So for each of the vehicles, give three alternative routes. And then, um, so I'll paint it here. So let's say I have a couple of vehicles and a couple of roads here. Um, and then for each of these routes that you give to the vehicle, let me adjust that screen a little, um, you, or well, we segmented the roads. So we created road segments here, here too, 
Let's go further here. Uh, and we, we want to formulate this as an optimization problem. Because remember, with an annealing system, you can solve optimization problems. So what we did was um, we defined a factor or, or, or a variable called road occupancy. And the road occupancy is counted, uh, uh, is, is given by counting the number of vehicles that share a road segment at the same time based on the prediction. So let's say I predict um, that we will uh, have, uh, let's say, 10 vehicles here um, sharing that road segment here. Uh, let's say 10 is our threshold. We know if I go above 10, um, I will have traffic jam. If I'm below 10, I will uh, not have traffic jam. Everything is fine. Of course, it's more complex because we want to make sure that we also consider roads uh, with three, four, five lanes. We want to make sure that we um, consider speed limits, uh, whatever it is. But for now, let's just count the number of vehicles that share a road segment at a given point in time. And um, so we predict where the road occupancy goes above 10. Um, if we are above 10, we want to make sure that um, all the vehicles that contribute to being above 10 are redistributed before they're there. And that's the optimization problem. So again, let's give three possible routes to um, all the vehicles. Um, let's say it's 500 vehicles. Then um, my solution space is 3 to the power of 500. That's a lot. So that means with a classical algorithm, I would have, in the worst case, to evaluate all these possible configurations to find what's the best distribution, what's the best vehicle distribution. The one that minimizes the road occupancy for every segment. And uh, remember, I can't just take 500 vehicles and move them somewhere else and cause traffic jam there and say, oh, fine, it's solved here. What happens there? I don't care. That's not what happens. So what we want to do is find a distribution that considers um, the areas that these vehicles are distributed into. So we want to make sure if we distribute 500 vehicles, we don't cause traffic jam there. So you, you probably know um, some mapping systems that you use for navigating and routing. Sometimes they predict there is traffic jam ahead and then they tell you leave the highway now. Um, there are two things. So on the one hand, they give you the real time data. So it's um, based on what's happening now. It's not predicted. And the other thing is they will reroute 300 vehicles and all of a sudden they have traffic jam there. That's not what we did. So we made it more complex. And you see the complexity of this optimization problem. And now if you think um, about how often we need to do that, um, because we can collect position data of vehicles every one to five seconds, we want to do this optimization every one to five seconds, end to end from getting the data, ingesting it, transforming it, embedding it on the jib, uh, reading it out, interpreting the results, communicating back to the vehicles. That's what we did. And uh, this requires us to be very fast with a quantum chip. It was possible. There is also, this is not quantum supremacy. This is a problem that you can solve with a classical computer still, but it will take minutes, maybe hours, depending on how many vehicles you ingest and how many routes there are. And uh, we don't have hours because our prediction is 15 minutes ahead. And as early as possible, I need to start thinking about how to reroute these vehicles, not one minute before they contribute to a traffic jam, 14 minutes and 55 seconds before they contribute to a traffic jam. That's what we want. Um, also, we looked into reinforcement learning. This is a totally different problem. Um, you know reinforcement learning. Reinforcement learning is um, a part of uh, artificial intelligence. It's learning by experience, you could say. Um, and again, I give you uh, a very practical example with vehicles. Um, that's just the field I'm most familiar with. So let's say you want to teach uh, a self-driving vehicle a parking maneuver. Um, you can um, record everything the driver does, everything the vehicle sees, um, and do one million parking maneuvers. Every time the vehicle hits something, hits another car, hits a, um, I don't know, a hydrant, um, then you punish the vehicle, the agent in that case, or the software agent. Um, anytime it does a good parking maneuver, executes a good parking maneuver, you want to make sure to reward it. So bad behavior is punished, good behavior is rewarded. And um, let's say I want to do that one million times. It would be uh, a tough thing to have a driver do this parking maneuver one million times. And for some things, there is just no way around it. So let's say we want to collect data for self-driving vehicles or really driving everywhere in the cities, through cities, then we have to record everything and have to have drivers do that. But in that case, or let's say you want to have a robot moving through a room, I may be able to do it with simulations. 
So that means I just let the agent simulate um, this behavior 1 million times, which is a lot faster. I can even do that on the fly. So that means if I uh, have that self-driving vehicle and it's sufficiently fast with simulating that behavior 1 million times, then I can adapt to any given situation. The algorithm is there and it will learn based on punishment and reward what the optimal policy is. That's what we're after, optimal policy, optimal behavior in any given situation. And um, that's how it works. So either I train that algorithm based on observations before, um, or I let him uh, let the algorithm do it on the fly, also possible. So it depends on, on what you want to do. And uh, the idea that I had back then was, um, I want to make sure that I can do this, find this optimal policy, the optimal behavior rather quickly. I know that we won't have quantum chips in cars, at least not in the foreseeable future. future. But what if I could do at least um, this training faster and then maybe deploy our algorithms faster, so have shorter learning cycles, have um, um, faster technology cycles, so improve our uh, capabilities faster. And I was looking into that and uh, the, the problem that I looked at, the first problem was very simple. It's blackjack. It's not self-driving vehicles, but blackjack is a very simple problem. You have two actions, which is continue to play, stop to play. You have um, your cards at hand, given a number of points. You have the dealer's hand showing um, and the dealer continuing to play or not. So it's basically based on your decision. So you want to decide if you want to play or not. And uh, your points and the dealer hand uh, that give you the state of the system, the right now, the state at a given time. And the interesting thing is um, the state in one game may be the same as a state in another game, but a different point in time, either earlier or later. Um, this is uh, it's just how that game works. So not always will be you will you experience or be in the same state at the same time. So depending on when you are in a certain state, you may make a different decision. So you want to consider that. And uh, I took 1 million games of blackjack uh, and uh, formulated it such that you can embed it on a quantum chip, on a D-Wave in that case, uh, formulated an optimization problem, so when to optimally stop the game to win. That's what I wanted to do. And um, my idea was, let, me the, let the chip give me the optimal result, so the optimal solution to the problem. In the end, what happened was um, that uh, the result I got is uh, still one third of the observations activated, which means so the, the D-Wave chip, what it does is it gives you a result vector. So the result vector may look like that. And so on, which is, let's say you have 2000 qubits, then you have 2000 numbers, 2000 ones and zeros down here. And uh, one means qubits that in one, zero means qubits that in zero. So give me the best action for every state at a given time. That's what I wanted. And um, the chip found that, but it returned. So each um, each qubit here gives a certain state um, plus action back. So what happened here was that instead of give me the optimal policy, I eliminated only one third, uh, two thirds of the observations, and one third of the observations came back. I'm still wondering. I'm still wondering today because I didn't have time to look into that further uh, why that happened. Maybe I didn't optimally formulate the problem. But um, still, it's an important result because that's an unsolved problem in reinforcement learning. So in reinforcement learning, a question is, how can I get rid of the irrelevant observations before training an algorithm? Because I want to make sure the algorithm is faster. The redundant observations, get rid of them. And uh, this algorithm does it. So it gives me, um, most interestingly, almost always, depend, not, not, doesn't matter how many observations I have, Almost always, it gives me back two thirds of the observations, uh, one third of the observations, and get rid of two thirds of the observations. If I now take that one third of the remaining observations and feed it into a classical algorithm, classical reinforcement learning algorithm, and uh, let's say I do Monte Carlo search and I uh, want to find the policy with a with, uh, classical one, then um, the result will be equally good as if I would feed in all observations. And that's a very interesting result. If you're interested in that in more detail, I'll publish that. Uh, almost three years ago, um, you can find it here. This is just one other example, so that you can see uh, the variety of these problems. 
I also have a clustering problem here, um, which I will not talk in uh, too much detail because it's also related to machine learning. Also this quantum neural network, we will skip that. So if you're interested, feel free to look into it. Here, electronic structure calculations. It turns out that I cannot only do that with gate model quantum computers because gate model quantum computers are thought to be the um, quantum simulators uh, for of the future. You can also do it with um, quantum annealing systems. So still it's an optimization problem, but what I wanna find is the ground state of a molecule, the, the minimum energy configuration of a molecule. And uh, there is a theorem that says, if I find that ground state of a molecule here in my algorithm, then this is most likely um, most similar to the real wave function of that molecule. It gives me the uh, most accurate simulation that I can do. I have some more details here, how I did it or how we did it. And um, it's just, um, if you're interested, please feel free to look through that. A lot of this will become um, more clear once we're done with our lecture. Uh, but for now, these are just some examples that I thought may be interesting to you. So I will skip these um, details here. Uh, one other thing that I looked at, and this is the last um, problem I will talk about, so all the others, um, you should feel free to look into yourself. And if you have questions, please let me know. I'd be happy to, to discuss everything in detail. Actually, this problem, uh, one of your colleagues, uh, Dion von Wermingen, um, solved for us. So he was an intern in uh, the quantum team in San Francisco. And um, so we asked him to uh, do a finite elements um, design optimization. So you know uh, finite elements, what that means is um, you take any part, uh, let's say you have a part of a vehicle, let's say it's an exterior mirror, you create a number of finite elements, let's say 1 million or 2 million, like a mesh around that mirror, and uh, these angles you can manipulate. So you can manip manipulate the design based on physical properties or parameters. And uh, what we wanted is, um, find the design uh, of a mirror that minimizes the wind noise uh, at the driver's seat. Uh, so this is a physical quantity, but anything, basically any physical quantity can be minimized. Let's say I have the weight of an engine block, then it can also be solved with this finite elements method. So how can I minimize the weight of this engine block? Um, <clears throat> what they did here, so you can see a sphere um, on that slide on the right, um, this is not, an exterior mirror, but we had to start somewhere. So and the idea was take um, uh, a rigid sphere um, and have an acoustic monopole emitting a spherical wave towards that sphere. And then we have, um, you see that square here um, or rectangle, then we have an area um, that's the target area where we want to minimize reflection. So the rays or the spherical, so in that case, it's a ray casting problem. We translated the spherical wave into a ray casting problem, so rays, which turns out is a suitable approximation, although it's not the exact problem. So I want to minimize the number of rays that hit back or are reflected back onto that area. And uh, this is very similar to the acoustics problem. So we want to minimize the wind noise at the driver's seat, right? So if I can do that, we can also do it with the mirror or any other physical problem. And um, so I'll skip that slide. This is the original problem formulation for the problem. So we have this acoustic monopole emitting the spherical wave, and we have the reflecting surface uh, elements of this rigid sphere. And uh, here you see a number of microphones. In that case, it's 180 microphones placed around it. And any microphone that I choose um, could be, so I could choose any of these microphones and say at this area, I want to minimize the reflection and want to minimize the noise. <clears throat> So for this, Dion um, changed the problem into a uh, raycasting problem. So instead of that spherical wave that's emitted, we have still that monopole here on a lower graphic. Um, that monopole emits some rays and these are reflected by the sphere. So how can I maximally preserve the shape of the sphere, but in the same, at the same time, minimize the number of rays that are reflected back to a certain area? And uh, here is how he formulated that problem. I will just um, explain so much. Um, a chip, a quantum chip, if you look at it, um, you have quantum bits. Um, let's say I have my, I make rings here because it's uh, mostly it's superconducting rings, but basically any quantum bit will do. And I have connections. So I have uh, weighted connections between these rings. And this is how you can embed this problem onto the chip. So 
you can define some quantity, whatever quantity it is, let's call it the reflection coefficient. How many, um, let's say I make it bigger, the more rays are reflected back to that area and I wanna minimize it. So I wanna make a small reflection coefficient. So in that, um, the reflection coefficient is complex because the reflection coefficient uh, needs to encompass the angles. So the final shape, it needs to um, encompass how many rays are reflected back. So it's different for each of the elements. And uh, this is how you formulate that problem. So you can bring that into a big matrix. And once you have that big matrix with interacting um, angles, some neighboring parts um, being qubits interacting with each other, um, then you can um, embed it on a chip. And hopefully, if you formulate it correctly, uh, the wave system will give you the optimal configuration that the one that minimizes that reflection coefficient for each of the elements. And that's what Dion did. Here's a more detailed explanation for it. Um, and please feel free to look into that and also our publication that you can find online. But um, that's that. Um, we'll, we'll talk about how a quantum annealing system works later, as I mentioned, but just wanted to show you what you can do or different things that you can do. And here is the result. The resulting shape still somewhat resembles a sphere because that's what we want to make sure of. Um, it doesn't do us any good. Let's say we simulate that exterior mirror and we get back a stick. Of course, the stick in the end will minimize the wind noise, but it's not a mirror anymore. So I still want to have a mirror. So I'll skip um, over the other use cases. There's a lot more we've done. This is just some things that I thought would be interesting. The next thing I will talk about is quantum theory, um, which incorporates uh, the uh, for postulates of quantum mechanics. Uh, and uh, again, so in more detail, how different quantum mechanics is to our classical world. Uh, and this will be the next lecture.